Good afternoon. Uh, since we were last here, the press of the world has been full of information concerning the practices of the U.S. listeners and statements from presidents, premiers, chancellors, and senators on the subject. Our purpose this time being to consider the political meaning of Mr. Snowden and the future he has brought us, we must begin by discarding for immediate purposes pretty much everything said by the presidents, the premiers, the chancellors, and the senators. It has been a remarkable display of misdirection and misleading and lying. We'll come back to it, but it will not serve us at the outset. It is indeed really what doesn't matter, all the froth that we've been reading since we were last together, from the respondents. We need to keep our eye on the thinking behind Mr. Snowden's activities, which he has done much more to explain since we were last together, and we need to understand the message he has sent us. And so, for that purpose, I come again before you. What matters most, and what it has been the goal of the presidents, the chancellors, the premiers, and the senators not to say, is how deeply the whole of the human race has been ensnared in the process of pervasive surveillance that destroys freedom. The fastening of the procedures of totalitarianism on the human race is the political subject about which Mr. Snowden has summoned us to an urgent inquiry. And it is that which it has been the goal of pretty much everybody responding on behalf of any government or state, not just to ignore, but to obscure. We begin, therefore, where they are determined not to end, with the question whether any form of democratic self-government anywhere is consistent with the kind of massive pervasive surveillance into which the United States government has led not only us, but the world. This should not actually be a complicated inquiry. For almost everyone who lived through the 20th century, at least its middle half, the idea that freedom was consistent with the procedures of totalitarianism was not on. Those who fought against it, those who sacrificed their lives to it and had to begin again as displaced persons and refugees around the world, and those who suffered under the harrow of it were perfectly clear that a society that listens to every telephone call and spies on every meeting and keeps track of everybody's movements is incompatible with a scheme of ordered liberty as Justice Benjamin Cardozo defined American constitutional freedom. But at the beginning of the 21st century, what seemed clear and absolutely unnecessary to inquire into in the 20th is now apparently a question. So perhaps we'd better address it directly. A large number of people in the United States have in their family tree, in their genetic material, in their understanding of the world, awareness of a system that made everybody keep track of their movements and have a pass, that gave some people the right to scrutinize every communication of everybody else, that made every home subject to intrusion and disruption at the whim of other power. For those 
who have tasted the bitterness of slavery in their past, it should not be necessary to explain why the rules, however velvet the glove in which they are contained may be, however invisible the system within which they are contained, the system that keeps track, the system that listens everywhere, the system that knows no boundaries in America is slavery. We should not need to inquire carrying as we do our own history closest. We should not need to inquire whether a system of power which listens everywhere, which can go everywhere, which keeps track of everybody's thoughts and feelings and speech is inconsistent with freedom. We know because we have lived on both sides of it. And we know it's evil. But let us forget what we have learned by bitter experience, what we carry in our own chests. Let us forget it. Let us put it aside. Let us be law professors, shall we, and political scientists. For analytical purposes, let us take this word privacy that we are using quite freely and take a little bit more care about what it really is. Privacy, as we use the word in our conversations now all around the world and particularly when we talk about the net, privacy really means three things. The first is secrecy. Our ability to keep messages private so that their content is known only to the people we intend to receive them. Anonymity, which is our ability to keep our messages, even when they are open, obscure as to who has published them and who is receiving them. Anonymity is about both publishing and reading. And autonomy which is the ability to make our life decisions independent upon force which has violated our secrecy or our anonymity. These are the principal components of the thing that we call privacy. And you will discover, as you look at it more closely, that with respect to each, we are talking about a precondition to the order we call democracy, liberty, ordered liberty and self-government, to the scheme we call in the United States constitutional freedom. Without secrecy, democratic self-government is impossible because people may not discuss public affairs with those whom they choose, excluding those with whom they do not wish to converse. If you have lived in a society where in every dorm room, every workplace, every public transport vehicle, there was an agent whose job it was to listen and inform, and if you think about the consequences for political conversation in that neighborhood, you need go no further. If you are fortunate enough never to have had that experience, most of your comrades around the world can enlighten you. Anonymity is necessary for the conduct of democratic politics. The United States Supreme Court took until 1995 to recognize it, but it recognized it. And to the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, we owe a clear statement of the importance of anonymous political conversation at the core of the First Amendment. The cases in which the court has considered anonymity and its rights are precisely cases about political communication, central cases about the exercise of democracy, cases about accountability for taking political opinions that one wishes to keep one's name off. It is, as the chief noted in that 
inquiry, not terribly surprising that our greatest artifact of divine wisdom with respect to our constitution, a set of political pamphlets penned by three very slippery characters called Hamilton and Madison and Jay that we refer to as the Federalist Papers were of course published under pseudonym. That autonomy is altered by the invasion of secrecy and privacy that free decision-making is impossible in a society where every move is monitored. Those of you who have friends in North Korea may inquire into directly, if you please. But any conversation with those who lived through 20th century totalitarianisms or any contact with the realities of American slavery will surely clear up for you. In other words, though it shouldn't be necessary to demonstrate, though we ought to have taken the bitter experience of American history in the 19th century and the history of the West in the 20th for sufficient demonstration for those who really do like ignoring the facts and working it out with chalk, Privacy is a requirement of democratic self-government and the effort to fasten the procedures of pervasive surveillance on human society is the antithesis of liberty. This is the conversation that all the don't listen to my mobile phone has been not about for the last two weeks. And if it were up to power, it would remain at that phony level forever. So we are, at the moment, thanks to Mr. Snowden, who has precipitated what even his adversaries now like to call a necessary conversation, we are now in a necessary conversation in which on the other side there are parties who do not wish to explain exactly what they do and who have advanced and will advance no convincing argument that what they do is compatible with the morality of freedom, American constitutional law, or the human rights of every person in the world. They will not offer an argument. They will certainly not offer a defense. They will instead attempt as much as possible to change the subject and wherever they can to blame the messenger. But what you have seen around the world in the last two weeks is the evidence that this is extremely unlikely to work. And so we need to consider the political environment created by what has happened before we can begin to address the more or less empty rhetoric that has been assigned to the presidents, the chancellors, and the premiers. Why are they operating in this way, you may ask, nonetheless, as though everybody were on the same side? Here, the history is very clear and remarkably available. One does not need access to classified documents to see in records we will be making public as part of our effort in Snowden and the future over the next two weeks. It is very easy to see how the military and strategic thinkers in the United States adapted to the end of the Cold War by planning pervasive surveillance of the world's societies. In the early 90s, in documents that are in no way secret, the strategic and military planners made clear in the United States in a range of fora, the think tanks and the Pentagon and advanced research reports and in a variety of other ways, 
that they foresaw, as indeed we now observe, a world in which the United States had no significant state adversary and found itself locked in a series of asymmetric conflicts. That was the phrase. Guerrilla wars. In the course of that thinking, in the redefinition of the US strategic posture and threat assessments after the end of the Cold War, the American military strategists and their intelligence community colleagues came to regard American rights in communications privacy as the equivalent of sanctuary for guerrillas. The documents are very clear in describing precisely that relationship circa 1992-1993 in which it was understood that in future asymmetric conflicts, uh, the adversaries, uh, that means people, you understand, m bad people committed to bad activity, but small groups of individuals affiliated with and possessing the power of no state, these people would use communications facilities which benefited from American civil liberties as sanctuary and that it would be necessary to go after the sanctuaries. Of course, this was the position of military strategists and their listener colleagues. It was not national policy, but it was an important part of the policy formation discussion, albeit relatively quiet. There were, of course, political adults in the room. And while the United States government considered various efforts at improving its ability to listen to encrypted communications in the mid-90s, the Clinton administration had the clipper chip initiative, for example, and there were significant efforts to ensure that domestic law enforcement would not be disadvantaged by the movement to digital communications, which led in 1995 to the Kalea statute concerning the availability of wiretapping technical facilities in digital telephone systems that didn't natively offer them, a compromise which split the then nascent Electronic Frontier Foundation into two camps, one of which became CDT. Although there were steps taken to facilitate not only the work of the domestic law enforcement uh, uh, agencies, but also the listeners within the United States, as we now know, as we see the evolution of the FISA statute in the FISA court in secret judicature we couldn't see before, Still and all, there was a clear understanding that this idea of denying sanctuary uh, by uh, breaching American civil liberties in US-based communications uh, was not part of the senior policy-making dialogue. It was part of what one team constantly pushed for, as they did after the first World Trade Center bombing, after the African embassy bombings, after the coal, the whole pervasive surveillance system, not just the Patriot Act, but all the pieces that we now understand surrounded it in the secret world's understanding, were constantly advocated for at the end of the 20th century and as constantly rebuffed. And then, as we saw last time, at the opening of the 21st century, an American administration, which will go down in history, famous for its tendency to think last and shoot first, bought hook, line, and sinker the entire scheme. And within a very short time, after January of 2002, mostly in secret, put it all together. The consequences around the world were remarkably uncontroversial. By and large, states approved or accepted 
Some of this happened because the United States government was even then using quite extraordinary muscle around the world after September of 2001, you were with us or against us. But it also happened because so many other governments around the world had come to base their national security systems in part on cooperation with American listening. And in the aftermath of the new global war on terror, that was made more true. By the time the present administration had settled into office in the United States, as one senior official with relevant responsibility described it to me halfway through the first term of the current administration. Uh, in our government to government relationships about the net, all of us, the Chinese, the Europeans and us, that was all of us at the table, we all agree about one thing this senior exec, this senior official of the U.S. government said to me back uh, at the, before the start of this decade, um, we all agree about one thing, about exfiltration. This is the listener's word for spying, exfiltration. They exfiltrate data off our networks into their warehouses. So we all agree, this official said, about exfiltration. Everybody agrees that it can't be stopped and it shouldn't be limited. We disagree about what kinds of intervention, that is breaking things in the net, should be allowed. But the important point in this one conversation on which I hinge nothing, you can find this statement again and again in unclassified documents from the, this administration even. The important point was that American senior policymakers thought there was general consensus around the world that everybody could listen to everybody's societies. It could not be stopped. It shouldn't be limited. The Chinese agreed. The Americans agreed. The Europeans agreed, which really meant, of course, that they were dependent on American listening and hadn't a lot of power to object. Nobody told the people of the world. What was common understanding among the policy-making elite who governed among them still only about a third of the world's population. But the policy-making elite was pretty much convinced that global civil society was a free fire zone for everybody's listeners and there wasn't anything to be said about it, particularly not to all those people who were supposed to not know. This is the condition upon which the whistles started to blow all over the field, as I said last time. Throughout the situational ethics of all of this, a few people, all of them in the English-speaking world, all of them people who came from societies with strong traditions of the rule of law, protection for whistleblowers, some form of civilian political control over domestic and security intelligence, whistleblowers began to speak up. Mr. Snowden saw what happened to precedent whistleblowers and behaved accordingly. What had opened by the end of the first decade of the 21st century was a gap between what the people of the world thought their rights were and what their governments had given away in return for intelligence useful only to the government, a gap so wide so fundamental to the meaning of democracy that those who operated the system began to disbelieve in its legitimacy, as they should have done. Mr. Snowden's political theory has been quite exact and quite consistent. From his first statements in Hong Kong, through his interview with James Risen of the New York Times, to his statement over the weekend sent 
to our colleagues and comrades in Washington, D.C., seeking to have them stop watching us, whoever us might be. Mr. Snowden has been very clear. The existence of these programs undisclosed to the American people is a fundamental violation of American democratic value. Surely there can be no argument with that. Mr. Snowden's position is that efforts so comprehensive, so overwhelmingly powerful, and so conducive to abuse should not be undertaken save with democratic consent. And Mr. Snowden has expressed recurrently his belief that the American people are entitled to give that consent. But Mr. Snowden has also identified the fastening of those programs on the global population as a subject which deserves a form of moral and ethical analysis that goes behind mere raison d'etat. Mr. Snowden said again to Mr. Risen in some detail what he had suggested in his statements in Hong Kong, we have dealt with terrorists and rogue states before. We do not need to do all of this in order to achieve control over those problems. People have acted, Mr. Snowden said, as you will recall, analysts are not bad people and they don't want to think of themselves as bad people, but they have adopted a misleading metric. They think if a program produces anything, it is justified. Because, of course, the very essence of democracy is that it is for the people to judge what is justified with respect to, to the entrenchments of their rights and invasions there, too. And I think that Mr. Snowden means, as certainly I and my comrades mean, that in the exercise of the democratic discretion to determine whether we wish to fasten these procedures of totalitarianism on other people in the world, that we should consider our values as extending beyond our borders. And that we should make those decisions not in the narrow, selfish self-interest that is raison d'etat, but in some sense of what it is appropriate for a beacon of liberty to humanity to do. We will speak, of course, about American constitutional law and about the importance of American legal phenomena, rules, protections, rights, duties, with respect to all of this. But we should be clear in our minds that when we talk about American constitutional tradition with respect to the avoidance of slavery, we're talking about more than what is written in the law books. We face a system in which the states have almost without exception, agreed complicitously to deliver over their people to a form of pervasive spying which we know is incompatible with our own liberty and with the liberty that we have frequently postured in the world as bringing to the human race as a whole. We know this. As individual citizens, we are now aware Mr. Snowden has made it impossible for us to ignore unless we bury our heads so deep in the sand that we are likely to suffocate. But we face two claims. You meet them everywhere you turn, which are basically the politics against which we are working. One argument says it's hopeless. Privacy is gone. Why struggle? And the other one says, I'm not doing anything wrong. Why should I care? And these, neither one of them a brilliant argument from a political point of view, these are actually the most significant forms of opposition that we face in thinking about what we mean to do 
about the political situation in which we find ourselves. The premise of my being here before you is that it is far from hopeless. Mr. Snowden has described to us, as I told you last time, what armor still works. Mr. Snowden's purpose was to explain to us how to distinguish between those things hopelessly corrupted and no longer usable, those things endangered by a continuing assault on the part of an agency gone rogue, and those things which even with their vast power, all their wealth, and all their misplaced ambition, conscientiousness, and effort, they still cannot break. Hopelessness is merely what you are supposed to get, not what you have. And so far as the other argument is concerned, we owe it to ourselves to be quite clear in response, my own personal position, I recommend to my comrades around the world, if we are not doing anything wrong, then we have a right to resist. If we are not doing anything wrong, then we have a right to do everything we can to maintain the traditional balance between us and power that is listening. We have a right to be obscure. We have a right to mumble. We have a right to speak languages they do not get. We have a right to meet when and where and how we please so as to evade the patty rollers. We have an American constitutional tradition against general warrants. It was formed in the 18th century for good reason. It puts the limit of the state's ability to search and seize at what you can convince a neutral magistrate in a particular situation about a place, a time, a thing is a reasonable use of governmental power. That principle was dear to the first Congress which put it in the Bill of Rights because it was dear to British North Americans because in the course of the 18th century they learned what executive government could do with general warrants to search everything everywhere for anything they didn't like and use local police to get them to do it. That was a problem in Massachusetts in 1761 and it remained a problem until the end of British rule in North America and still it was a problem because the presidents, premiers, chancellors, and senators back then were also unprincipled in their behavior. Thomas Jefferson talks a better game than he plays, but never mind. The principle is clear enough, but there are only nine votes in the United States that count on that subject right now. And we must wait to see how many of them are prepared to face the simple unconstitutionality of something too big to fail. A challenge for justice. A thing that makes a lifetime in the history books one way or the other. And those nine votes are the only votes that matter about that and we must go about our business in other ways. The First Amendment, too, as I have pointed out, conveys to every listener in the 20th century a message in favor of privacy and anonymity and the ability to speak freely to whom one chooses without being forced by government to disclose. I remember NAACP against Alabama. But the NSA was never really schooled in the idea that the social graph of the United States is nobody's damn business. When a senior government official said to me in March of 2012, well, we know we need a robust social graph of the United States, I said, let's talk about the constitutionality of that for just a moment. You mean you're going to take us from being a free society to a society in which the federal government keeps a list of everybody every American knows? You proposing to do that with, say, a law? And he just laughed. Because they did it by a document signed by the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence released after dark on a rainy Wednesday night in March. 
no legislation at all was necessary, or at any rate, they thought it wasn't. That was when they decided to take all the information about Americans about whom nothing is suspected, and instead of ditching it after 18 months, keep it for five years, which is the equivalent of forever. That was an administrative decision. No law at all. So what we found ourselves living with, we could think of as unconstitutional in that sense. But I would urge you to consider the possibility that there exists a second American constitutional tradition also relevant. You see, the American constitutional tradition we admire in the books was made by people mostly who fled Europe and came to North America in order to be free. And it is their activity, politically and intellectually, which we find deposited in the documents that made the republic. But there is a second constitutional tradition, and it was made by people who were brought here without their will being involved and who had to run away here in order to be free. And that constitutional tradition is slightly different in its nature, though it conduces eventually to a similar result. Running away from slavery is a group activity. Running away from slavery requires the assistance of those who believe that slavery is wrong. People in the United States have forgotten how much of our constitutional tradition was made in the contact between people who needed to run away in order to be free and people who knew that they needed to be helped because slavery is wrong. People in the United States have now forgotten that in the summer of 1854 when Anthony Burns, who had run away from slavery in Richmond, Virginia, was returned by the federal court in Boston, that Boston itself had to be placed under martial law for three whole days. That federal troops lined the streets as Anthony Burns was marched down to Boston Harbor and put aboard a ship to be sent back to slavery if Boston had not been held down by force, it would have risen. When Frederick Douglass ran away from slavery in 1838, he had the help of his beloved Anna Murray, who sent him part of her savings to travel on and who sent him the sailor's clothing that he wore. He had the help of a free black seaman who gave him those identity papers. He had the help of many dedicated people who risked many things, property and life, to help him reach New York. We fought slavery. As Frederick Douglass pointed out, long before Abraham Lincoln wanted to. Though he may have hated it, as Douglass said at the Great Memorial in 1876 for him, he may have hated it with his whole soul. Our constitutional tradition is not merely contained in the negative rights to be so famously found in the Bill of Rights. It is also contained in the proposition that liberty must be given to everybody always. That it must be accorded people as a right, that slavery is wrong that it cannot be tolerated, that it must be fought, and that the way to fight it is to help people be free. And so the constitutional tradition we should be defending now as Americans is a tradition which extends far beyond whatever boundary it is the Fourth Amendment has in space, a place, or time. Not merely a right to be free from the oppressive attentions of the national government, not merely something embodied in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment after 1962 because of a trunk of smut left behind by a departing lodger in Mrs. Mapp's boarding house in Ohio. 
but rather because slavery is wrong. Because fastening it on the human race is wrong. Because providing the energy, the money, the technology, the system for subduing everybody's privacy around the world, for destroying sanctuary in American freedom of speech is wrong. And if we're going to exercise our democratic rights in the United States, as Mr. Snowden wishes us to do and has given us the most valuable thing that democratic self-governing people can have, namely information about what is going on, if we are to do all of that, we should have clear in our minds the political ideas upon which we ought to be acting, which are not parochial or national or found in the US reports alone. A nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal enslaved millions of people. And it washed away that sin in a terrible war. And we should learn from that as we are called upon now to do. The politics that we have as Americans are slightly more complicated, but they are fundamentally the same as the politics upon which our colleagues and comrades around the world must also move. Everywhere, citizens must demand two things of their governments. In the first place, you have a responsibility, a duty, to protect our rights by guarding us against the spying of outsiders. Every government has that responsibility. Every government has the responsibility to protect the rights of its citizens to be free from the intrusive spying of outsiders. No government can pretend to sovereignty and to responsibility with respect to its citizens unless it makes every effort within its power and its means to assure that outcome. And every government around the world must subject its domestic listening to the rule of law. Now this is the tragedy of where the overwhelming arrogance of the listeners has left the American government. The government of the United States could have held up its head until the day before yesterday and said that its listeners, unlike all the other listeners in the world, were subject to the rule of law. And it would have been a, an accurate boast. To be sure, the rule of law, even in the last generation, was somewhat corrupted by secret judicature in courts appointed by a single decision maker, and so on and so on. But the truth is American listening was subject to the rule of law as no one else's was in the world or is now. For nothing they threw that away, history will record. For nothing they threw that away. But it is true that everywhere, whether we are here or we are in China or we are in Germany or we're in Spain or wherever we are, those two basic principles of our politics are uniformly applicable. Our government must defend us against pervasive spying by outsiders and our government must subject listening to the rule of law at home. To the citizens of the United States, a greater responsibility is given. Because we must act to subject our government to control in the listening it is doing to hundreds of millions and ultimately billions of people around the world. Ours is the government that is projecting immensities of power into the destruction of privacy in the world society. And ours is the government which must be put under democratic control with respect to that listening. And it is our principles in favorum libertatis which must be the dominant principles in that story. Freedom has been hunted around the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. 
Europe has been bullied into treating her like a stranger, and England would arrest her at Heathrow if she arrived. The President of the United States has demanded that no one shall receive the fugitive, and maybe only Dima Rousseff wants to prepare in time an asylum for mankind. You heard a lot of stuff from governments around the world the last two weeks, but not one that consisted of, I regret subjecting my population to these procedures. The German Chancellor, though triumphantly re-elected, with not a cloud in the political sky, the German Chancellor is in no position to say, I agreed with the Americans to allow 40 million telephone calls a day to be intercepted in Germany. I just want them to stop listening to my phone. <laughs> the President of the United States is considering the possibility of not listening to 35 mobile phones around the world. <laughs> the other several hundred million people are stone out of luck. You understand what a charade this is, of course. The leaders of global societies do not conduct their classified business over their personal mobile phones. Our listening there is not gaining us important military intelligence. The President of the United States is publicly considering not listening to conversations that leaders of other countries have with their spouse, their siblings, and their children. But the conversations that 900 million other people are having with their spouse, their siblings, and their children remain fair game. Nobody is talking about that. You're not supposed to think about it. The listeners are having a political crisis beyond their previous imaginations in the United States. Listeners do not like to appear in the spotlight. Listeners do not like to be visible at all. The NSA and our other listeners have always worked to keep at least one, if not more than one, agency or person between themselves and public scrutiny at all times. They have destroyed their credibility, as I told you last time, with the domestic security industry around the world, which has realized that they have broken their implicit promises about what they would hack. The global financial industry is overwhelmed with fear at what they've done, at their recklessness in dealing with the crypto that holds the financial system together. And the agencies of the United States government they usually count upon are fleeing them. First, the National Institute of Science and Technology comes out and says, yes, yes, the NSA corrupted an important computer security standard we published. We're terribly sorry about that. We're going to fix it. as though this were the first time that had ever happened. And then, as you notice, two days after we were last here together, the New York Times made itself the vehicle for a leak about how the CIA had almost caught Snowden in 2009, and he was just a common spy after all, until the following weekend when the CIA denied it. Said, no, we had no such Understanding, Mr. Snowden was attempting to report a security problem in some software. Mr. Snowden clarified the entire story in his interview with Mr. Risen. For the first time in recorded history, the CIA refused to carry water for the listeners. That was an enormous event. Equivalent in scale to the announcement that General Alexander and the chief civilian administrator of the NSA, Mr. Chris Inglis, will retire next March. But the most terrible thing that has happened to them in the politics of all of this happened over the German chancellor's manufactured tantrum. When the United States government's chief executive, the White House itself, began to want the NSA to appear in between them and the truth. Oh, no, we weren't told that people were listening to the German chancellor's mobile phone. Oh, yes, of course we told you. 
Suddenly, the National Security Agency was standing in the full glare of daylight, being asked to take a bullet by the White House and refusing. We will never have another moment of similar political disarray on the side that works against freedom. Not only have they made the issue around the world clear to everybody, not only have they created martyrs in our comrades at Fort Leavenworth, at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and at an undisclosed location in Moscow. Not only have they lit this fire beyond the point where they can piss it out, but they have lost their armor. They stand before us in the fullness of who they really are. And it is up to us to show that we recognize them. They are, after all, just us. Just good patriotic Americans like us. Nothing wrong with them that an election wouldn't cure. But it will have to be an election to remember. A parliament of wonders. And it won't have to be just here. What they have done is to build a state of permanent war into the net. Twelve years into a war that will never seem to end, they are making the net a wartime place forever. We must have peace. We must reimagine what a net at peace would look like, cyber peace. The young people around the world now working on the theory of cyber peace are doing the most important political work of the later 21st century. Because we will now have to provide what democracies provide, which is the end of wars. We have to be willing to declare victory and go home. And when we do, we have to leave behind a net which is no longer in a state of war and which no longer uses surveillance to destroy the privacy that founds democracy. This is a matter of international public law. In the end, this is about something like prohibiting chemical weapons or landmines. Pervasive surveillance of other people's societies is wrong. And we must not do it. And our politics, everywhere around the world, our politics are going to have to be based in the restoration of the morality of freedom, which it is the job of democracy to do. The difficulty is that we have not only our good and patriotic fellow citizens to deal with, for whom an election is a sufficient remedy, but we have also an immense structure of private surveillance that has come into existence in this net. A structure which has every right to exist in a free market, but which is now creating ecological disaster, from which governments alone have benefited, and from which people have been rendered far less well off than they think they are and should have been. You don't need today's Washington Post on the subject of the massive interception of information flowing in and out of Google and Yahoo, and soon it will be Facebook and Microsoft's cloud as we begin to understand what government is doing with the cloud. You don't need any of that to understand that at the end of the day, we have to assess not only what the states have done, but what unregulated enterprise has done to the ecology of privacy. And we have to consider not only, therefore, what our politics are with respect to the states, but also with respect to the enterprises, which is the subject of 
our talk next time. But for now, we are left attending a puppet show in which the people who are the legitimate objects of international surveillance, namely politicians at the heads of state, military officers, and diplomats, are yelling and screaming about how they should not be listened to, as though they were us and had a right to be left alone. And that, of course, is what they want. They want to confuse us. They want us to think that they are us, that they're not the people who allowed this to happen, who cheered it on, who went into business with it. The literature of our time has not been deceptive about this. If one reads Jean Le Carré's views about the security industry in Germany under the global war on terror, Le Carré, as you recall, had his actual experience as an intelligence officer on behalf of the British government in Germany. And if you look at uh, what a most wanted man says about the nature of the listener, uh, dialogue between the Germans and the Americans and its effect on freedom, you will discover that, after all, everybody really did know, except you. The purpose of secrecy was to keep you in the dark. The purpose of secrecy was not to prevent the states from knowing what they were doing, their left hands and their right hands fooling them. And we're going to have to cope with the problems of that. Because among the things our listeners have destroyed is the internet freedom policy of the United States government. We had a good game that we were talking. But we have comrades and colleagues around the world working for the freedom of the net in dangerous societies who have depended upon government support and assistance from the United States government and who now have every reason to be worried and to be frightened. What if the Underground Railroad had been constantly under efforts of penetration by the United States government on behalf of slavery? What if every book for the last 500 years had been reporting its readers at headquarters? People talk about this as though it were a matter of the publicity of what we publish rather than the destruction of the anonymity of what we read. And we will have to look next time very closely at what commercial surveillance really does and how it really does it in order to understand what our politics have to be because there as here, deception, misdirection, waving the handkerchief brightly over here so you do not see what the other hand is doing is the whole basis of how it works. The bad news for the people of the world is you were lied to thoroughly by everybody for nearly 20 years. And the good news is Mr. Snowden told you the truth. But if we really believe that the truth will set us free, we better do it now. Thank you very much.